We don't have to fear shadows They just mean that there's a light Shining right behind them Saying it'll be alright You don't need to walk behind me out in the lead Just walk along beside me You know that's all I project had its beginning in the year 2003, 20 years ago, with the idea of bringing change to a world seeking change. It continues to be a small nonprofit with a big goal of changing the world. Hello, this is Brent Carlson. Welcome to Brethren Voices. Live and in person, we have David Radcliffe with us today, director of the New Community Project. David, it's great to have you with us. Brent, it's great to be back, as Again, always. I was trying to count how many times we've had you on the show, and then I lost track. But it's Not least, enough, that's not, all I can not, <laughs> not enough. Earth Care <laughs> is one of the headings in the new Community Project website. Yeah. Tell us about Earth Care. The Earth needs care. Boy, the Earth needs care. And it needs care that we are not giving it. We are making a fine mess of this fine planet. And I try, to make that, I try to make that point in whatever setting I'm in, whatever else I'm talking about, because as the earth goes, we go. And so if we don't take care of the mother, the mother won't be able to take care of us. I mean, mother will outlive us. I'm, I'm clear about that, but in an altered state, because we're taking a lot down with us as we go. I think I provided you with a statistic before the session started. 69% fewer living creatures on the planet than in 1970. So that's the diminishment of other living things. Not species extinction, but the, this is the actual numbers of other living things on land, in the water, in the air. There are three billion fewer birds, songbirds, in North America than 1970. Insect populations are going down at two, three, four percent per year around the world. We think we don't need insects. They just bug us. <laughs> but we're going to find out that these, these small creatures are part of the pillars of life Absolutely. on this planet. Not Absolutely. to mention all the stuff underground that we're killing with our pesticides, herbicides, and all that stuff, all the microfungal things and all that sort of thing. So this whole part, it's all an interconnected whole. We refuse to see ourselves as part of the interconnected whole. We're so anthropocentric that we think it's just about us, and we're going to learn it's not. I heard, and you, you probably know more specifically, but half of our food comes from flowers. Hmm. And without the insects and the bees to pollinate, we don't have that food. And that's part of the population that's diminishing. Exactly. So I don't know that people... We're biting are, the hand that feeds us, literally. Yeah. We're biting the hands and the wings that feed us. Do you want to talk about anything about the Arctic, or the Atlantic Ocean and the ice melt oh out of Greenland? Oh, my goodness. Well, the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean... Uh, there are a number of factors with the oceans these days, as, every, as everybody knows, I'm sure. I mean, they're warming, which, you know, not only is worse for the coral reefs, which we hear a lot about. I mean, it's almost as warm as a hot tub. Hot yeah. as warm as a hot tub, hot they say. Imagine, of, of course, Miami that's affecting Beach. the coral as well as the humans that want to dip their toe in. But the other thing about warmth is warm water holds less oxygen. And so we've had fish species off the coast of Virginia, where I live, migrating north because they have to get to cooler water to have enough air to breathe. You know, we think fish don't have to breathe air. Well, they do. They just get it from the water. Uh, also, as carbon dioxide, which we're producing way too much of these days, I think our parts per million of carbon dioxide in the global atmosphere is like 419 parts per million, up from a baseline of 280 parts per million wow. before the Industrial Revolution. Uh, so we're producing way too much carbon dioxide, and it settles on the oceans, and pr it creates carbonic acid. That doesn't even sound good. <laughs> and then for the, the cr shell creatures, they can't form shells. Oh, That's got to be embarrassing. Yeah. Plus the fact that, you know, you cannot live your shell creature without a shell. Uh, also, um, the, the, in terms of the Atlantic as a whole, everyone knows about the Gulf Stream, 
what carries the warmer waters up from the tropics below the southern hemisphere, up across the equator, up to the northern hemisphere, up into up near Greenland, down by Europe, and then drops back down. And by the way, that's a thousand year conveyor belt. I had no idea about that until I began reading about this. But it goes over by the Indian Ocean and wow. then swings back. It's a thousand years. So that thing is in, pr in trouble. Because for one thing, when you say a thousand years, it takes it takes uh, put a drop of water here, but time it goes that whole circuit bay and gets back to here a thousand years. Okay. Yes, yes. And so one of the biggest problems is there's a lot of fresh water coming in from Greenland. Uh, in fact, last September, almost a little less than a year ago, at the end of the northern hemisphere summer, Greenland was losing 12 billion tons of meltwater into the North Atlantic every day. 12 billion tons of meltwater into the Atlantic Ocean every day. I think it's, it's almost incomprehensible. It is. A, and then part of the problem with that is, as, the, as this water from the southern hemisphere comes up, it's salt water, of course, in the ocean. And, uh, and as, it, as it cools, that salt kind of makes it, 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 it makes it more dense. And it sinks to the bottom and starts the tractor beam back to the south. Well, you start putting all this fresh water into the northern part of that, it's going to dilute that. And then you've already got indications that the Gulf Stream is stalling. Now, to give you one little kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? One little example of what consequence that may have. England and Hudson Bay are at the same latitude. Hudson Bay has polar bears. Yeah. The reason England doesn't is because of the Gulf Stream. So That keeps it warmer. Yes. So King Charles is, Charles is going to have more problems than his kids if the Gulf Stream stalls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do, you, how do you develop partnerships that you can trust with these communities around the world? I take, I, I, we don't have any, uh, any set of uh, criteria anybody's got to meet. We have been really lucky to find the people that seem to be in our, on our wavelength and doing things in a way that's not for themselves mm -hmm. and with an eye, ear to the ground to hear the people and the, the, the currents in their society. Well, I, I mean, we have all kinds of strange ways that we found these people. One of them, we, a woman from Malawi, we met at a covered dish meal, or a, pot, a, not a, a donor's meal, a supporter's meal in Vermont. She was there on an exchange program with 350.org, the climate change organization. Oh, that's, I've heard of it. And so we had invited the director of that organization because our friend, our, my, my colleague Pete up there knows her, and she got invited. Well, she brought Tiona with her to the meeting where we have, we provide a meal for our supporters, and they get a, a big also containers of Ben and Jerry's ice cream because they donate it to the cause when we're having a meeting in Vermont. Um, and so Tawana came and she saw my pictures, heard the stories and said, you need to come to Malawi. So that was in the fall of 18. In May of 19, Tom Benevento and I, after our South Sudan Rwanda trip with a bigger group, he and I went on down to Malawi for our first visit there. Wow. So, and then it's been, a, you know, say a marriage made in heaven. I mean, we all, I mean, they're facing lots of challenges. And I don't want to make it seem like it's a, you know, a paradise. They have yeah. lots of challenges. But the things we have to offer each other is what I'm saying. And so in various ways, we've come upon these relationships that have ended with Charlie up in Arctic Village. I called our, I heard a, a person speak at a National Council of Churches event back in 2001, probably, from Arctic Village in Washington, D.C. I was taken by what he was saying about the oil drilling and all these things in Gwich'in culture. And um, a guy at the conference said, I was just up in Arctic Village, a Methodist guy, friend J.D. Hansen. He said, it's one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen. I'm thinking, who doesn't want to go there? You've got the beauty, but you've also got the issues. Yeah. And that's kind of the thing that we're, we're looking for the beauty in each culture and in each people and in each natural setting. We're also looking for the challenges they face and especially where they involve us as with the Arctic. So... I called the village. I got the chief answered or something at the community center, at the offices. He said, well, you need to talk to Charlie Sweeney. So I talked to Charlie Sweeney. I'd never met the guy before. I'm taking a group of 10 or 15 people up there, uh, landing in an airstrip in the most isolated community in the West, northern hemisphere, not knowing if this guy's going to show up at the landing strip to meet us, honestly. And what happens next? And there we go. And it was yeah. all beauty after Wonderful. that with Charlie. So, yeah. so just a variety of ways that we have lucked into, been led into these relationships that I think are beneficial to them. At least I don't want to be in it if it's not. Yeah. And certainly beneficial to us. Great. So tell us about the, the um, Danae Lybrook yeah. 
community I've, in mm -hmm. New Mexico. We've been really fortunate to have a relationship with them for about seven or eight years now. We have been working with the Gwich'in for over 20 years. We've been going to the Ecuadorian Amazon now for about, mm, boy, 17 years, 17 or 18 years. So we had kind of native communities on either side of us far away that we were connected to. We never had a native group in the lower 48 that, with whom we could affiliate in some way. Well, I met the directors there, the kind of the managers there uh, back seven or eight years ago. And this is a Brethren mission. It is. In 1952, I think, it started as a Brethren mission spot there. And they provided services over the years. There have been a school there. There's currently there's been health clinics. There's currently a water point there. Also, just various kinds of community services. They offer firewood and some other things. Um, so we were able to start going there again seven or eight years ago. I think 2016 would have been our first trip there. Um, and that has really blossomed. And now there's a, a native couple, not couple, native mother and son, a couple of people, that are organizing programs there. Marlene Thomas and uh, Eric Dennison, her son, they're the ones coordinating. First time, and that started last year, uh, well, actually started at the beginning of COVID, but the first time we could go was last year because of COVID, uh, that they hosted us. And so it's, a, as far as I know, the first time in the history of that mission site that the mission's being carried out by a native family, mm -hmm. native people, which yeah. I find encouraging, frankly. Yeah. And so we have a great experience when we go there, learning about, we visit with a medicine woman. I'd love to talk to you with, about Dorothy Kitso for a while sometime. Visit with, she's a hand trembler. I'm not going to go any further with this because we could get in a long conversation. <laughs> but we meet with Dorothy Kitso. Uh, we also meet with craftspeople. Uh, we do the fracking tour because uh, the hydraulic fracking, fracking is going on big, big gangbusters out on the, this part of the Navajo area. It's not a reservation. It's really called the checkerboard area because all the land is divided up into family plots or clan plots. And so it's not a reservation that some upper authority is making decisions for the whole. It's individuals making decisions for themselves about whether they allow the fracking on their land because they can sell they, off the rights to they, the- And they can make some money. They can make some money or they can't make money. Mm -hmm. They can. They can, but sometimes they don't. Yeah. But still, it's, of course, they're a very impoverished situation. Yeah. In some ways, um, you know, it's hard to blame them but also there's a lot of water pollution, air pollution, rumbling of trucks back through the area, all kinds of other environmental and human impacts. So we learn about that. We visit Chaco Culture National Historical Park, about an hour's drive away, spend a better part of a day there, ex experience a culture that was in decline beginning about 1100 AD. So before the Europeans ever got here to make a mess of things, that, that civilization had declined. For, could be climate related, nobody knows for sure. Anyway, so we do a variety of things there that help us understand the Diné, the native people there better and their culture and their life, current lifestyle, and then to experience the current issues that they face. Can you just explain, so there's oil in this area. Can you just explain in 30 words or less what fracking is and why it's such a controversial issue? Fracking is injecting high pressure water and chemicals up to a mile underground breaking up the substructure, the rocks and things that are there, to release the gas and the oil that are trapped in the porous rocks and substructure there. And they can also, that same pipeline or fracking operation can go four or five miles uh, horizontally. horizontally. Yes, and busting up as it goes. And that brings the oil and, and the it gas releases, up. it releases. I think sometimes it's a natural flow, other times you kind of got to pump it out, but that comes back out, mixed in with all the chemicals and water you pumped down in the begin with. So that's called uh, production uh, waste or production water or some production water. And they have that in pools where they're collecting it to try to re recuperate the water that's wasted. And then they separate out the oil and gas and ship it out or burn it off. Mm -hmm. The oil is, I think, the primary thing they're getting. By the way, New Mexico is the second leading producer of petroleum in the United States after Texas. Is that right? I did not realize I, that until this trip. Uh, and so they ship off the oil and often burn off or release off the methane, the gas, which some, is a huge climate change gas. I was going to say, there's also some long-term consequences. Long-term consequence. There's a methane haze yeah. over this area. Uh, we talked to a... Um, uh, Samuel Sage, uh, a native elder there, who gave us the fracking tour this time. We were with him this last June. And he said, I can, I'll never forget the day the bus driver came in soon after school had started and just said, I can't believe how many children are on inhalers now. Oh my God. The asthma. And so, or other kinds of complications. I don't know what they might be. But so it is having very, very clear detrimental impacts. We're going to take a musical break right now, sharing some of your photos that you've taken over the past few years 
to the music of Mike Cern's song, One World. It's our own creation, David, this musical photo thing, and hopefully it'll bring back some nice memories. I'd be honored to have my slides put to his music. We want to thank Mike Stern for the use of his song, One World. And David, your photos about many, so many things and new community projects are just wonderful. Mm -hmm. We thank you for sharing those. And it really is about making relationships. I, I'm convinced of that as well. So you're celebrating the 20th anniversary. You probably have experienced more than you ever imagined. We have been able to see some of your some of your projects, some of your learning tours. What's been the biggest surprise over the last 20 years? Whoa. Wow. Um, probably that we're still around. Uh, who would have thought when we first began this? It was kind of on, on a wing and a prayer, honestly. I had no idea. But I found that people have kind of rallied around what we're working on at New Community Project. I don't, I don't say I'm surprised by that, but I am a little bit surprised and gratified that we're making something out of this. And it's because people, I think, I think people 
respond to good people doing good things in a good way. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of organizations, too, not just New Community Project, of course. Yeah. In your your you all with your brethren voices, I mean, you're doing good things in a good way with good people. But I find people respond to that, and they want to know what they can do and how they can help. And that's been very gratifying. So that's been, that's been probably the most, uh, I don't want to say unexpected, but you never know when you start something like this. That's right. You never know. And just to be deeply gratified that people have been with us. I tell groups all the time, we're nothing without you. And I mean it. And I don't mean just financial support. I mean the moral support, the idea that we're in this together. We all need to know we're not fighting these battles alone. We hope to give that sentiment to our network, to the people around us, especially young people, but old people too. And also we, we receive that from them, this idea that we're, we're a team here. We're working towards something together. I really like your 4-H, the heart, head, hands, and health. health. So is this planet going to go over the edge? Are we going down the toilet? What do you think? Well, um, we've got the whole world in our hands. To put a twist on that old song, we've got the whole world in our hands. And it's the choices that we're making, and especially this, this emerging generation, the choices they are making, will really tell the tale. We need uh, deep and soon changes. I think it's within the human capability to do it. But we need leadership on this. And again, the people at the top aren't asking much of us these days. They think we can green our way out of this predicament by certain scientific methods and new town and technologies and new energy sources. I think it's going to take all of us springing up from the grassroots to put the pressure on those at the top and to take matters into our own hands, frankly, and figure out how we're going to get from where we are now through the difficult times ahead, which I think there are going to be, because there's enough in the pipeline about climate change and species uh, destruction and all the other things that are going on. There's enough in the pipeline. It's going to be bumps in the road for sure, but we hope there's not a cliff. And whether there's going to be a cliff or not totally depends on us. I think it's amazing that many years ago we had, we were limiting our thermostats and turning them down. We were slowing down on, on the highways to conserve fuel. And we don't hear anything about that now. We don't hear. Nobody from the president on down is asking anything from us. No. And yet I feel like, I don't want to speak for the American people in general because I'd have a hard time figuring them out too. But for a lot of us in, in the moral middle ground, I feel like that we would respond yeah. to the right kind of challenge. Yeah. And so, but I don't find anyone doing that. I think they're, they're afraid of the next election, really. Yeah. And of course, they're getting resources, financial resources from all the corporations that are benefiting from the destructive path that we're on. Yeah. So how do we be the ones who raise the vision to see the thing that's out there, the better thing that's out there, and set our own trajectory uh, to, meet that, to meet that vision? And then I think others will follow. I mean, you and I, well, those of us who try to live a little more consciously about things, when we do something different, we notice that other people notice. Mm -hmm. And of course, it may perturb them sometimes, but it also may invite and excite them sometimes to see that somebody's stepping out on a new path. And well, that's sort of the American mantra. Yeah. I mean, the frontier, this is the new frontier. Yeah. And do we have the courage to walk it? Well, it's the old mantra is, be the change you want to make. So, David, it's wonderful, as always, to sit and talk to you. A blessing and a pleasure, Brent. Thank you a so pleasure much. pleasure is mine. For Brethren Voices, this is Brent Carlson. And this is David Radcliffe. Wishing, wishing you, you peace. peace. Pass it on. Just prior to the completion of this program with David Radcliffe, President Joe Biden's administration canceled all remaining oil and gas leases from drilling and other development in Alaska's fragile Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. It moved to protect an additional 13 million acres in the nearby National Petroleum Reserve. Interior Secretary Deb Halen, who is the first Native American to hold a cabinet position, she told reporters, with today's actions, no one will have the right to drill for oil in one of the most sensitive landscapes on earth. Climate change is a crisis in our lifetime, she said, and we cannot ignore the disproportionate impact being felt in the Arctic. We contacted David Radcliffe about this 
amazing development to get his reaction to these actions. And he stated the recent decision by the Biden administration to put the coastal plain of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge off limits to oil drilling is so important. There is the environmental value as it will preserve one of the most pristine portions of our continent. David also said that the coastal plain is also the calving grounds for the porcupine caribou herd who make one of the world's longest land migrations every spring to this welcoming ecosystem. And for the Gwich'in people for whom the caribou are central to their lifestyle and culture, this decision is key to preserving their identity and we might say their survival as a people. For the rest of us, the coastal plain is refuge of the mind and spirit. And even if you never see it for ourselves, we know it is there and is a unique part of our planet. So speaking for the native Gwich'in, we'd like to express our Mother Earth rejoices in this small victory. We still have so much work to save our planet and save Mother Earth from ourselves. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. 